Welcome everyone uh, to the Empowering the Truth Summit, and uh, we are excited to kick off this uh, event uh, with a keynote talk uh, that will set the tone uh, for the entire summit. Uh, the world of digital media is complex and constantly evolving, and it can be difficult to navigate. Uh, we are bombarded with information from all directions, and it can be challenging uh, to distinguish facts from fiction. That's why we are thrilled to have Professor Hudson Burns here today uh, to share expertise on the anatomy of this information. As an Australian Research Council Laurel Fellow and a Professor in the Digital Media Research Centre at Queensland University of Technology, uh, he is one of the foremost experts in digital media and disinformation and has conducted extensive research on the spread of disinformation and the power of virality. And he will be sharing with uh, his insights with us today and um, we hope that uh, we are going to extensively gain from this wealth of knowledge. Uh, it, will, it will help us to examine how this information spreads and how we can use uh, this knowledge to promote accurate and truthful information. In addition, uh, we expect that it will provide valuable insights uh, into the complex world of digital media and how we can navigate it to make the truth go viral. And um, this keynote is a real opportunity to learn uh, from one of the foremost experts in the field and gain a deeper understanding of the power of viral content. And uh, we're looking forward to an engaging and informative session, which we hope uh, you are going to enjoy too. So without much further, without further ado, uh, please uh, join me uh, in uh, in welcoming uh, Professor Hazel Bronza to the Empowering the Truth uh, Summit uh, from the International Centers for Journalists and its partners. Hi, how are you doing today? And thanks for joining us. Very good. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, and uh, and thank you for the invitation. Yes, and um, looking at um, looking at um, the subject matter, uh, when uh, for somebody like you, when you hear the word uh, disinformation, uh, I think if which I think may not be your presentation, um, what endeared you to this subject matter? Well, there is so much of it, I guess. Uh, to begin with, um, of course, we've had since the mid 2010s at least this kind of increase and in building up of mis- and disinformation um, the, around uh, major events, of course, like the uh, election of Donald Trump, like Brexit, like other uh, events like this. And then, of course, this even was amplified further when it came to the pandemic. And um, uh, during that time, particularly since early 2020, we've seen the, this explosion of um, well, of mis- and disinformation both, uh, and by misinformation I really mean unintentionally, you know, false information that is being shared uh, in good faith um, versus disinformation that is deliberately, intentionally false information that is being shared in order to deceive. So both of those types of, of problematic information, mis- and disinformation, um, have certainly been shared very widely since the pandemic broke and in the aftermath with lockdowns and vaccines and everything else. Um, and we're, we're continuing to see this, of course, now. So it's simply a, a, a massive topic in not just digital media and social media research, but in, in media research and communication research more broadly as well. And of course, one that has uh, potentially deadly consequences, quite literally. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that. And um, I would also like to welcome our participants uh, who are joining us across different platforms. So if you are with us on the Zoom platform, uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, irrespective of your time, uh, the time over wherever you are. And uh, we'd like to have an idea of where you're joining us from and your name. So if you can introduce your name yourself and where you're joining us from in the chat box that you have, please uh, use that play, uh, channel and uh, to engage with us and uh, we'll we are happy that you can join us today. And um, if you're also on the, if you're also watching this live stream on Facebook, I want to also welcome you and say we are glad that you can join us today. And um, also let us know uh, in the comment box below the video that you're watching right now, uh, uh, what, uh, which part of the world uh, you are joining us from. And um, if you don't know already, we are going to have a series of uh, sessions uh, touching on different topics. And um, at the end of this summit, um, there will be opportunities uh, uh, for grants uh, for you to be able to enjoy and access uh, uh, 
some grant, uh, grant opportunities dedicated for this uh, uh, series. So please and please uh, follow this series through and um, I'll bring you additional, additional information at the end of the session and uh, before the end of the entire summit. So I'm going to stop right there because I know uh, our guest has a slide prepared and I would like him to go straight into the presentation and I'll go back with the interactive session. While he shares the screen, if you want, if you have any question, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to use the Q&A and, hey, and um, eventually you can raise your hand to ask questions, but please uh, introduce yourself in the chat box and uh, use the Q&A uh, to ask your questions. Yes, I've opened the chat box for everyone now. Please, thank you for making me aware of that. So yeah, over to you. All right, thank you very much. It's again, very great to talk to you about this topic. I do want to start also by acknowledging uh, my colleagues, Edward Herkham and Stephen Harrington, uh, who I've worked with here at QUT on this particular research and on a broader research project that deals with myths and disinformation. Um, we've worked very closely together on, on the analysis that I'm going to present here as a case study for virality in the context of COVID-19 particularly, but really as a case study of virality in of, of myths and disinformation much more broadly as well. And also before I get started, as we do here in Australia, I want to acknowledge the Turbo and Yagra people as the first nations owners of the lands where my university QUT now stands. Uh, I want to pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and recognize that these unceded lands that I live and work on have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Um, we as a university now personally acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. So um, what I'm going to talk about today really is um, the information side of the pandemic, which the UN, as you may be aware, has called an infodemic. Um, uh, this was as early as late March 2020, so fairly early days in the context of the pandemic itself as well. Um, and uh, this is really the, 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 the informational side of the pandemic. Uh, I don't want to go too far with viral metaphors in the context of an actual viral pandemic, of course, but um, we we have talked since well before the pandemic, of course, of, of the viral spread of information, misinformation, disinformation. Um, so it's quite natural that these metaphors are also uh, uh, aligning with the actual pandemic itself. Um, what I do want to talk about specifically is a is a detailed case study that we conducted of, a, of the spread of a particular form of uh, conspiracy theory uh, relate, presenting mis- and disinformation or disinformation ultimately um, around the supposed and entirely non-existent links, I want to make that very clear from the start, between COVID-19 and 5G mobile phone technologies. Um, this is just one example, this, this post on Facebook from the, the rapper Wiz Khalifa, um, you know, just making, you know, this this kind of connection or, or, or claiming this kind of connection between COVID and 5G. We've seen many more of these sorts of things. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this then also led to uh, a, quite a wave of attacks on um, 5G and other mobile phone towers and technology uh, around uh, the world, particularly in the UK, where, as you see there, in this New York Times report from early April 2020, um, it says that more than 100 incidents had already occurred uh, in, in April, um, in April 2020, so quite early on, really, in the, in the course of the pandemic as well. Um, we then also, of course, saw releases like this from the Australian government of uh, advice uh, that basically said there is no link uh, between 5G and COVID-19, quite rightly so, um, but these came quite late in the game as well. This is from the 20th of May. By that time, uh, those 100 phone towers had already burnt in the UK, for instance. Um, and we got these kinds of slightly ironic events as well that, uh, you know, the people protesting against the, the scandemic and uh, against mandatory vaccination, then also always linked this with 5G. And in the case of my town in Brisbane here, they protested in front of the Brisbane City Hall, which happens to have the best 5G coverage in the in the city. So there's a certain amount of irony and lack of awareness perhaps there as well. Um, uh, we've 
gone on further into other forms of, uh, of conspiracy theories. I just want to highlight this and I can share, of course, the slides with you all as well. Um, if you're looking uh, for, for other cases like this as well, but um, uh, what I really want to say with this is we've, we've done quite a bit of work on this and other conspiracy theories and other forms of mis and disinformation as they've spread, uh, particularly through the pandemic. Um, and I'm really using these kinds of cases as an example to discuss the viral spread of mis and disinformation um, during this event and uh, highlight particularly also um, the, the role, I guess, that the media from the fringes to the mainstream actually have played in this uh, in both combating it, but to some extent, unfortunately, also in amplifying it. Um, so that's where, really where I want to go with this. Um, part of the questions that we asked ourselves uh, in the context of the COVID 5G conspiracy theory was really, well, what, what are they saying in the first place? What is actually circulating and by whom? Um, how do media engage with and respond to these claims? Again, from the fringes to the mainstream. Um, what about counteractions like takedowns of posts from social media platforms where these claims were circulating? Does that help in any way in, in reducing and in, in arresting the dissemination of this kind of content? And to some extent also, well, how do other official actors respond? Journalists, yes, but also government actors, uh, technology companies, and so on. What can they do? What should they do? At what point should they do it as well? So these are some of the guiding questions for what I'm uh, talking to you here today. Um, uh, what we've done for this particular study, if you're interested in uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the methodology here as well, is um, we searched via the Facebook data tool CrowdTangle for posts on Facebook that contained both terms related to COVID, so COVID, coronavirus, epidemic, uh, epidemic, epidemic uh, uh, and so on, pandemic, um, and the term 5G, which is a fairly clear and unique marker, of course, for, for 5G technology. Um, so we gathered posts via CrowdTangle for the first few months of uh, 2020, so really from well before this was declared a pandemic to the middle of April when those mobile phone towers in the UK were already burning. Um, there are limitations with this, I have to make very clear, because CrowdTangle as a data tool is useful, but only to a point. It only contains data on public pages, public groups, and public verified profiles on Facebook, so nothing that, that exists on people's personal profiles. Um, in, in short, I'm going to call these public spaces on Facebook, just so I don't have to repeat pages, groups, and verified profiles all the time. Um, uh, so CrowdTangle doesn't give us what, what happens in more private spaces on Facebook, but the public side of this is really the tip of the iceberg already of the transmission. And of course, because it's so public, is also more likely to, to spread widely and quickly. Um, we uh, uh, are also limited by, of course, where and how Facebook is available and is being used uh, around the world. So obviously in countries where Facebook is banned, um, there will we, we won't have much data. Um, where perhaps Facebook is not uh, the number one platform. Again, uh, there may not be that much data for us. Um, and our searches, as you see, they are really very much in the Latin alphabet. So in Cyrillic, in uh, Chinese characters and Korean characters and so on, Greek, um, we wouldn't have any posts unless they also happen to contain the Latin characters for COVID and 5G, which is possible from time to time. So this is to some extent uh, skewing perhaps towards a broadly Western Latin alphabet, at least, uh, use. And of course, because we didn't search for all variants of the term COVID, uh, for instance, in Poland, um, it's coronavirus with a K and a W. So that would not show up unless they happen to also use COVID or other related terms that we would have picked up on. Uh, but that in itself already gave us nearly 90,000 posts um, that contained COVID and 5G in various forms. Uh, that also, as it turns out, included some false positives because there once were some Facebook posts, for instance, that talked about um, the uh, Chinese government erecting uh, field hospitals that uh, to, to deal with the COVID uh, pandemic um, that were in, enabled by 5G or using 5G drones to, to spray uh, uh, disinfectant uh, around neighborhoods. So some of these posts would have also shown up, but uh, they certainly uh, behaved in a very different way from the viral content that we ended up seeing. Um, we also did something similar via the media database GDELT, the global database on events, uh, uh, language and tone. Um, 
Well, we again searched for similar terms or a slightly broader range because uh, in media reporting, there might be some more variation based on um, you know, how style and so on. Um, so we searched for, again, terms relating to COVID and 5G uh, in the same context for the same time frame. Um, uh, but because GDEL doesn't have full text, uh, this is limited to articles uh, where these terms appear together either in the title or the URL in, of the article, which is actually possibly in our advantage because if these terms are so important to be in the article title or the URL, then that's a pretty sure sign that the article is in fact about COVID and 5G together, rather than just mentioning COVID and or 5G in passing, um, uh, as, as may be the case in some other uh, uh, searches. So um, this is a more limited data set that way, but it's also a more focused data set. It is also simply a smaller data set. Um, uh, we had about 2,800 articles that uh, we managed to manually review, and out of those, there were 1,800 two true positives. Uh, the false positives were, again, articles about Chinese field hospitals and so on, but also articles about how the rollout of the latest 5G phones, for instance, was delayed by COVID and these sorts of things. So they were obviously not relevant to our for, for our purposes. So that's as a bit of preamble uh, about the data that I'm really gonna talk about. What we then did was really to use that data to explore how the conspiracy theories around COVID and 5G that we're trying to make a connection between these totally unrelated issues and um, how these conspiracy theories were spreading. So um, we've published quite a bit of that. Again, uh, uh, you're very welcome to have a look at these articles as well. I think at least two out of the three were published uh, open access as well, but uh, please let me know as well if you'd like a copy of any of these. Um, uh, and we split this up into coverage of the Facebook side, the, the media side, and then the combined analysis of both. Um, now, uh, we, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, analyzed the, the, the various aspects uh, of the data that I've talked about in these articles. And what I'm presenting here is, uh, is really the combined analysis, ultimately, of, of all of this. Um, and that's really what it looks like uh, in, in the sort of raw sense. Uh, you see at the top there the volume of posts on Facebook uh, that we picked up, and you see very clearly it, it, it uh, very slowly rises, and then sort of by mid-March or so really starts to take off a bit more. Then, of course, in early April when those arson attacks are happening, that's really when there's a lot of discussion. Um, and uh, for the media coverage at the bottom there, um, that's even more pronounced. There is uh, not a lot of coverage at all until mid-March, when there is quite a significant uh, peak uh, spike in activity. And then, of course, things really take off as these arson attacks are happening. Um, now, for the purpose of our analysis, we've then divided this into essentially five phases. And if we're looking at the, the Facebook uh, curve of activity here again, you see that there are these sorts of phase changes, really, that are quite pronounced in late January in late February, in mid-March, in late March, um, there's a real jump up in, in terms of the volume of activity um, that we can uh, see in on Facebook. Um, and so we've, we've really looked at, well, what's driving particularly these phase changes? Why is there suddenly this kind of elevation from one step to the other? So what I want to do reasonably briefly in the next little while is take you through these phases to give you an idea of really this this conspiracy theory essentially going viral, if you want to call it that, spreading from very obscure origins to much greater visibility and ultimately to a point where it inspires these arson attacks uh, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, so that's really what I, what I want to take you through uh, as I talk about these phases. Um, I also want to point out, and this is not a great graph, but um, what we've tried to do here is really to distinguish um, the, the space, the Facebook groups and pages, the Facebook spaces that are sharing this conspiracy theory by the size of their subscriber base, the, the number of followers that they have on Facebook. And again, there's a real phase shift that happens in early to mid-March where, where you see that basically up until that point, um, 40, 50 percent or so of the spaces that were sharing this kind of stuff um, had fewer than 1,000 followers. That's the pink, green, and purple lines here. Um, so ultimately, this was circulating still in fairly small spaces for the most part. But from early to mid-March onwards, that really changes. 
and you see much more engagement by, by spaces between 10,000 and 100,000 followers and 100,000 and, and well about 4 million followers as well. So that's those um, uh, uh, teal and yellow and blue uh, lines at the top there. So not only is there greater activity, more posts being posted about this COVID 5G conspiracy theory, but they're also being posted in spaces on Facebook that have a much larger audience uh, for this kind of content. So um, from mid-March onwards, um, we're seeing these conspiracy theories reach a much larger audience and really ultimately also a much more mainstream audience through this um, than we saw in the in the early parts of this of this process. So again, there's something going on there. And we were of course very interested to see, well, what is it that that makes this spread uh, so much at that point? So let me go through the phases a little bit then. Um, uh, in, and as you've seen from the graph already, in the first phase, really roughly throughout January, nothing much happens, to be honest. Um, uh, there are some isolated posts that either make pre-existing claims about 5G and talk a little bit about COVID on the side as well, but don't really connect them very clearly yet. Um, there are some posts that simply talk generically about pandemics without actually mentioning COVID-19, and the term COVID-19 itself was not actually in that much circulation at that point, so we're perhaps just generally talking about, well, eventually 5G will cause a pandemic or something, so there, there are a few claims like that already circulating, a whole bunch of other related uh, uh, stories about chemtrails and so on. And then we really saw this post that you see on the screen there from a, um, an obscure French blog uh, that was then shared on a on a, a Facebook page uh, called Stop 5G 5G Lille in France. Um, so uh, an anti 5G and pre existing anti 5G page um, that was trying to make a connection between uh, 5G and uh, the, the the virus itself, uh, basically, um, and was claiming that Wuhan was a test region for the 5G rollout in China. I have no idea whether that's actually true or not, but that's the claim that that really was driving this. Um, but ultimately, throughout this time, it stayed very much in small Facebook spaces, predominantly with certainly with, with fewer than 100,000 followers. So for by Facebook standards, that's really a very small audience that, that would have possibly exposed to these sorts of claims. Of course, the fact that the space has that number of followers doesn't mean that all of those followers are also seeing all of its posts. So the real numbers might have been even smaller. Um, and we so practically no media coverage, not even in fringe sites, in conspiracy sites, in sites like Infowars and so on that, that might be tempted to, um, to, to cover this, this sort of content. Um, so it really circulated just amongst a pre-existing group of people who were perhaps anti-5G already, like this page clearly was, um, but that's where it stayed. And uh, largely it was also in, in languages other than English, by the way. So um, there, there wasn't a huge deal of, of English language circulation at that point. Um, it then took off a little bit more from late January onwards, um, as this kind of content moved through a number of languages to begin with. Um, so from the French anti 5G blog that I showed you, it then moved also into um, this German alternative medicine site and this, this Facebook post here, which, by the way, not at the time, but subsequently, of course, as you see there, has been labeled as false information by Facebook. Um, so the Facebook fact checkers did their job on this, but obviously this, this wouldn't have happened in as early as January yet. Um, uh, so uh, it moved from French basically into German here, and the, the German basically also says, well, you know, it's it's making the connection says that well in 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 Wuhan uh, they rolled out five G so now they've got a virus uh, isn't that funny isn't that strange? Um, oddly enough, the the first English language version that we then saw was actually popping up in a K-pop fan forum um, uh, for for no really obvious reason. It's not like K-pop fans are necessarily more susceptible to to uh, uh, misinformation, conspiracy theories, disinformation. Um, it might just be that that fan forum had been poorly moderated, so it was possible to post this kind of content. But the English uh, content was quite close to what we're seeing here in terms of its its, its expression, its language, its its uh, descriptions. So it's quite possible that this was, if not a machine translation, then a, a manual translation from this German or the original French version as well. And gradually from there, it started to take off a little bit at least. And 
move through other English language conspiracy pages, um, embellishing this a bit more, not just saying, well, it's, it's 5G in Wuhan, but it, it was manufactured in a lab, it's activated by 5G and all these sorts of you know, stories that we, we know quite well by now, of course, uh, you know, three years later. Um, uh, it's possible that the, the, the rise in activity during this time is also because 5G was actually in the news independently um, in late January 2020, because there was quite a bit of debate about whether the UK at that point under Boris Johnson should allow Huawei to help build the British 5G network. At, at first, the, the UK government allowed it, then they kind of stepped back from that and, and, and changed their mind. There was criticism from the US about this as well. So there was quite a bit of debate about 5G, not in the context of COVID, but certainly as 5G itself. And the people who were who were actively trying to connect 5G with COVID obviously latched onto that to some extent as well. Even still though, few spaces had any significant follower numbers. Um, as you see there, only 10% of the spaces that shared any of this kind of content had between 100,000 and 1 million followers. So this is still fairly small numbers ultimately. Um, and I'll say a bit more about the media coverage in, uh, in along with the next uh, phase as well. It spread a bit further then from late February to sort of mid-March. Uh, and again, it was more this sort of embellishment of conspiracy theories um, linking the COVID 5G conspiracy story with other conspiracy stories featuring variously George Soros, Bill Gates, the UN, the Illuminati, the Antichrist, anything that, that you can name basically that, that there are conspiracy stories about. Um, a lot of alternative medicine theories emerged as well, people claiming that, again, erroneously, of course, claiming that 5G somehow reduces the lungs oxygen absorption and these sorts of stories. Um, there was quite a bit of early denialism, COVID denialism uh, starting to happen that basically said that there is no COVID, it's all 5G. Um, and of course, as the pandemic itself unfolded, and this is around the time, of course, that we started to call it a pandemic as well, um, uh, you know, the that was all kind of, that, that continued to kind of be adjusted to the new situation. Um, we gradually saw, again, more language spread as well. So here's an example, for instance, from, from Romania. I don't expect you all to be able to read Romanian, obviously, but if you look closely, you can see the uh, reference to the uh, Methuselah, George Soros, and Bill Gates, and um, vaccines, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, so um, there's there's the sort of language, obviously, that we're quite familiar with, unfortunately, now from conspiracy theories that start to circulate in a number of different languages, um, particularly also around the, the southeastern uh, and, and southern side of, of the European Union, by the way. And there is still some uh, suggestion here that there might be some level of coordinated spread. That's something we haven't had a chance to further investigate yet. But um, targeting particularly southeastern Europe um, would also not be um, uncommon for organized um, destabilization campaigns, as we now actually see them more in the context of the Ukraine war, by the way. But uh, um, it's possible that there was some active spreading of this kind of disinformation to undermine governments and so on as well. But that's, again, something we need to investigate further. Um, some of this growth also aligned with the start of lockdowns. Um, and that may, I mean, my my kind of um, uh, folk explanation here is, is that people simply have more time on their hands, of course, to to doom scroll and and ultimately also uh, in, in, in a quite serious sense, um, whenever there are uncertain situations, people try to seek information from anywhere they can find it. And if they're not happy with the official explanations that are in mainstream media saying, well, we don't know what caused it yet. We don't know how to deal with it yet. We don't know if it's airborne. We don't know exactly how to protect ourselves. Then yes, people will go to other sources and try and find more information from those to, um, to uh, yeah, perhaps explain what's going on around them. Um, so this again, that, that would very much align with the sort of growth as people are locked down and have nothing else to do and are trying to work out, well, how long is this gonna last? Am I gonna die? Am I, are my friends gonna die and so on? Um, but still at that point, the reach was quite limited. Really 70% of spaces had fewer than 10,000 followers at that point. Media coverage, as much as there was during this time, was largely amongst fringe outlets, particularly from the US. Um, 
you know, so the the kind of not even quite info wars and these sorts of sites, but the sort of the next level down from their um, conspiracy sites that were active around other topics as well, uh, whether that was Trump or Brexit or other things. Um, they were starting to pick up on this. Uh, of the 43 articles during these phases uh, that we saw, only 10 were fact check articles, a fairly large number of them, of, of the rest of them, were actually actively endorsing and supporting the conspiracy theory. So that's obviously quite problematic. And there wasn't a great deal of mainstream media coverage at this point. Um, Perhaps mainstream media thought this was just too obscure and not important enough to cover, um, but um, they they certainly didn't didn't uh, provide much coverage of this or much debunking of this. Where there was debunking, it came from technology sites that were obviously dealing with with um, 5G uh, in in other contexts as well, and business news sites again, perhaps because of the impact it might have on uh, companies that are rolling out 5G phones or 5, other forms of 5G technology. <laughs> And then things change. So from kind of mid-March, I'm going to call this onwards, uh, and through the rest of March, um, that's really when things take off. And I do need to point the finger here very clearly at celebrities that became super spreaders of this kind of content and celebrity tabloid and entertainment journalism that also was very actively spreading this kind of information as it came from the celebrities. Um, the, the earliest example in our data set, said, and I'm not really wanting to single out anyone because there were a number of celebrities involved in this, but it's a it's a useful example, was the US R&B singer Kerry Hilson, um, who on the 16th of March um, posted something on Twitter about the link between 5G and COVID. And as, as it says there in a post, by the way, not on her own Facebook page, but on the GQ Buzz Entertainment Facebook page, um, she asked her followers to turn off 5G by disabling LTE, which doesn't make any sense, of course, because they're entirely different technologies. But um, essentially what happened here um, was that, yes, a celebrity and multiple celebrities kind of latched on to this COVID 5G conspiracy theory and started to say, well, hey, maybe there's something to it. Best turn off your, um, sorry, my microphone just slipped. I'll just reinstate that. Um, uh, best turn off your, uh, your 5G or your devices uh, in order not to be exposed to this. Uh, that could be, as it says, they're causing the contagious virus, which is, of course, utter nonsense. Um, but this is not so much just about Kerry Hilson and her claims, but it's also then really about the entertainment journalism coverage of this kind of thing. You see there, as you, as you see the, the page uh, on Facebook uh, of GQ Buzz, that links to an article on the GQ Buzz website. That article looks something like this. Um, this is just an excerpt. Um, but as you're seeing there too, it actually embeds the tweets by Kerry Hilson in this article. And not just that, uh, in fact, screenshots ultimately of the tweets perhaps, but, um, but also it embeds, it, it shows very clearly um, the URL of the website that Kerry Hilson was sharing in her tweets. So suddenly you've got people who read GQ Buzz for entertainment content being fed conspiracy information and having direct access to a website that is spreading this entirely false conspiracy theory. Um, that to me is very problematic because it really short circuits the move from entertainment news to hardcore conspiracy theories and and uh, you know advice supposedly on on how to protect protect yourself from this sort of stuff um that that is ultimately quite quite deeply problematic i think uh, we saw this in a number of uh, cases as well and i'll show you a few a bit more of this uh, down the track um now quite a few of the, of, of the articles in entertainment tabloid uh, celebrity media that were covering this remain kind of neutral about this. They weren't saying, oh, wow, she might be right. Let's do something about this. But they also didn't debunk it or critique it in any way. Most of them said, hey, you know, a celebrity said something weird and possibly stupid. Isn't that funny? Can she really believe this? Is she going to get in trouble for this? Um, so it's much more about the celebrity than it is, than it is about the, the, the claim itself. But the claim, of course, is what's being spread. And the celebrities themselves might delete those conspiracy posts uh, fairly quickly again once they're advised by their agents that it's probably not a good idea to share this sort of stuff. Um, 
but the celebrity reporting, of course, continues to circulate, and particularly if the articles contain screenshots rather than embedded tweets or Facebook posts, then that content remains visible, even if the celebrity has taken that content down. And I'll return to that a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, now, what we saw um, here was that from these celebrity endorsements, um, there was quite a widespread, not just in uh, the US, the UK, uh, Europe, but particularly also in Africa and Southeast Asia, possibly because there are largish R&B and, and other related uh, music fandoms in those countries. Um, uh, this also amplified, of course, the conspiracy theorists themselves, not just the, 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 the uh, entertainment stars and others uh, themselves. Some of those were politicians and fringe journalists as well, by the way. Um, by now, more than or up to 40% of the spaces that were sharing this content had at least 10,000 followers. So gradually we're seeing the, the volume rise. Um, media coverage, the hundred or so articles really that, that we saw during this phase of a few weeks, were uh, there was a lot of entertainment coverage, lifestyle coverage, uh, sport and other um, uh, uh, sites as well. And many, unfortunately, direct either directly quoted conspiracists or co quoted cons celebrities quoting conspiracists. Um, so again, a significant amplification for the celebrity, uh, for the conspiracy theories through the mouths of celebrities during this time. But we did also, I need to acknowledge, see a, a certain growth in fact-checking articles, not necessarily in the same outlets, however. And that I think is also significant because seeing a, a, a debunking in the New York Times doesn't help you if you're only reading GQ Buzz. Um, that you're in fact not gonna see that debunk, uh, debunking article, of course, if you're not reading that particular outlet. Um, so the debunking would really need to happen, the fact-checking really would need to happen in the same outlets where uh, the initial claims by celebrities were reported. Um, I do wanna just quickly go back to this, this screenshot point again too, because I think this is a very significant and relatively easy fix in fact for, for entertainment journalism, for any kind of journalism ultimately as well. You know, if a celebrity or anyone else makes a problematic post, gets criticized for that post and deletes that post, then if the post was simply embedded in an article um, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, or, or just reported about uh, in an article, then it's a very much a temporary problem. Once the post itself goes away, then the reporting about it might still be there, but the original post is gone and can no longer be seen. But if the celebrity, if celebrity media report on that post, embed that post, or worse still, include a screenshot of that post, then that will continue to be visible well after the celebrity themselves thinks better of it and deletes that post. Um, as a very basic, simple, and slightly outdated example by now, you know, once upon a time when you went to the, the Donald Trump account, uh, you saw this because the account obviously had been suspended for encouraging an armed coup. Um, but of course, you could still very easily find, and this is just one example of a, of a silly tweet, but you could still very easily find plenty of articles across mainstream media that contain screenshots of Donald Trump's tweets. So that content remains very much visible, even if the original account has been suspended or deleted, taken down, whatever. Um, so the screenshotting and posting of content in news articles can very actively increase its longevity, its visibility, its permanence, its persistence. And that I think is a problem, particularly when we're dealing with deeply problematic content, not so much with the coffee fee tweet perhaps, but um, with many other tweets that um, uh, perhaps uh, it would be better if, if people were not able to encounter any. <laughs> so finally then let me uh, go through the fifth and final phase of our analysis. And that's really in, in late March to mid April. Um, that's really when it takes off, because by now, particularly through the celebrity amplification and the celebrity entertainment journalism amplification, um, it's everywhere now. It's 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 literally, I mean, almost literally gone viral, um, uh, and it's being embellished and extended in all sorts of directions. So we see posts like this on Facebook in um, in, in in French, obviously, that were you know producing basic simple numerology to link somehow COVID and 5G to the devil. Um, and that 
was in 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 a in a space that had or in spaces that had nearly 30 million followers it was also translated into english and reached even more followers then um there's a, a fairly well-known evangelical pastor in nigeria um uh, chris oyakilome who uh, was you know you sharing his sermons basically where again you see all sorts of things being connected the new world order ID 2020 vaccines, Internet of Things, 5G pandemic, COVID-19 year. Um, so uh, this is the sort of stuff that, that started to happen there. There's quite a strong evangelical kind of connection that started to emerge and that reached particularly through Africa, South Korea, Papua New Guinea, where there are strong evangelical communities in addition to other uh, uh, countries uh, in, in, in North America and Europe. Um, and the spaces, uh, that that posted or shared this post, for instance, um, uh, had more than 40 million followers. So this really reached ultimately or could have potentially reached a very large community. We did see one post as well that has been taken down uh, in the meantime, but the text looked something like this. And this is perhaps the closest that we've seen in our data to actually saying we must burn down the 5G towers in order to free ourselves from this. So as it says there, all these technologies need to be destroyed to melt so they can't keep radiating us. We need to clip all wires and burn it all in massive bonfires. Fire destroys all. Um, now, we we didn't necessarily see that this was very widely taken up, but this happened just before uh, the many arson attacks in the UK. So it is at least interesting in terms of the, the, the timing. Um, uh, and it's it spread in the UK, particularly through anti-5G spaces, uh, these sorts of stop 5G, Manchester, stop 5G, Liverpool kind of spaces. Um, so it is possible that this would have inspired at least some of the arson attacks that we saw in the end. We saw some very weird stories as well, opposed by supposedly a former Vodafone executive that has been, oh, sorry, this is still uh, for the previous post that has been deleted, luckily. We saw this sort of stuff by supposedly a former executive of Vodafone saying, yes, it's all true. 5G is the problem. It's not COVID. COVID's a scam. It's, it's the Antichrist, in fact. Now, this person was later revealed to be an evangelical pastor from Zimbabwe based in Luton in the UK. So there was a, perhaps a, a lot of kind of cashing in uh, on, on, these, uh, on these sorts of things. And then we, again, saw more celebrities, of course, getting involved in all of this as well. The uh, boxer Amir Khan in the UK, for instance, posted a conspiracy video that was then also taken up by the Give Me Sport page on Facebook, where he says it's a man-made thing. They're testing 5G, might be population control. These are all, of course, very common tropes in conspiracy circles. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's bad enough, in a sense, for this kind of content to be shared on a mainstream sports page but when we went on then to look at the actual article by give me sport on its website it embedded the entire youtube video as well so again massive amplification of this uh, of this youtube post by amir khan um, uh, that made it even more visible so um that's i think quite problematic because that's really um entertainment media tabloid media uh, sports media in this case uh, very much amplifying content um, uh, from these uh, celebrities who really uh, are, are spreading baseless conspiracy theories. We did see this, by the way, also pop up on the Express uh, uh, in, uh, website in the UK, uh, oddly enough, in, a, in the context of an article that's about YouTube tightening uh, rules about uh, um, conspiracy theories, but here they are writing about this and then embedding a conspiracy video, which is is particularly um, pernicious, I think, and I have a bit more to say about this particular article in a minute as well. Um, so this reaches large audiences, obviously, not just on Facebook, but, but via these uh, prominent websites as well. Um, by now, up to 60% of the posts that we're seeing are in spaces with more than 10,000 followers, and sometimes very much up to tens of millions of followers, so the, the reach potentially would have been much greater. And of course, this is when the arson attacks are starting to happen as well. Now, in terms of media coverage, a lot more is, of, of course, now about the arson attacks themselves. So that's not really about the conspiracy theory or spreading it. It's really just reporting on these attacks, but possibly also talking about, well, why are these towers being attacked? Some are very straight reporting on conspiracy theories, trying to understand why these are spreading. Some are also on government responses, like this uh, Michael Gov uh, in the UK um, standing at the podium saying this is dangerous nonsense and rubbish, which again, 
is probably not the best way to counter a conspiracy theory that says the government is out to get you. Um, Michael Gove is perhaps not the person to sell the, the, the counter message uh, particularly much. Um, but, you know, it, it, that needs to be done, obviously, as well. And um, we, we saw then also, of course, still quite a, a, a component of the articles that simply report about further claims from celebrities about this sort of COVID 5G conspiracy. What we do, do see, partly because simply there's this massive increase in reporting about the arson attacks themselves, is less direct quoting of conspiracy theorists, of the conspiracy theories themselves, less direct sharing. A lot of the articles are simply plain news reports now. Um, but Still, there is quite a bit of um, tabloid and entertainment journalism that continues to spread this sort of stuff without much critique, uh, certainly without any debunking. And that's what we, we've started to call the soft underbelly of the news industry. And I want to just go into this a little bit before we open for questions, um, because I think that's really one of the, the, the very significant um, entry points for conspiracy theories into mainstream discourse. Uh, so that is something that we all need to understand much better. Um, First of just this very, again, very basic graph that we have combined the first three phases, phase four and phase five, and, um, and just sort of shown here the relative approach to conspiracy theories in the coverage itself. So that you see early on, with very few articles actually doing the covering, it has to be said as well, there's quite a lot of just uh, direct support of conspiracy theories or reporting and quoting them. Um, in the fourth phase, when we get into the real celebrity endorsement phase, um, there's not that much direct support anymore of conspiracies, but a lot, a lot of articles of the, the articles that we saw during this phase that report on and directly quote conspiracy theories, conspiracy theorists or celebrities uh, presenting conspiracy talking points. Um, so a lot of very direct sharing and amplifying of conspiracy theories during this time. And that really changes very significantly once, once the arson attacks happen at last, but clearly not early enough, unfortunately. So what's happening here with uh, these tabloid entertainment celebrity outlets, uh, pages, uh, and other spaces that are sharing this sort of stuff? In part, of course, the celebrity saying stupid things is simply part of the business model for many of these outlets, many of these sites. Um, it's clickbait. It's perfect clickbait because some celebrity getting themselves into trouble for doing something stupid has always been the business model, has always been the, the main fodder for celebrity uh, journalism, if we want to call it that. But the problem, I think, increasingly is also, of course, that over the last 20 years or so, we've moved even further into this sort of clickbait model, um, clickbait as a business model, trying to create more and more sensationalist, controversial and sticky content that keeps people bringing back to a site. And of course, again, celebrities being stupid is, is just perfect for that. Um, and by the way, I just love this graph, this, this, this image which I've stolen from the search engine journal of the 12 surprising examples of clickbait headlines that work because it's just the perfect illustration of what a clickbait headline actually looks like. And we've seen this really with the coverage of Kerry Hilson and other celebrities saying this stuff, oh, look, Kerry Hilson got herself into trouble. You'll never believe what she's, she said now. That's precisely the sort of headline that we would, have, we would encounter in, in these sorts of circumstances. And of course, again, I've, I've sort of said entertainment journalists, but many of the people who work for these sites, for these pages, for these spaces on Facebook, are not necessarily journalists in, in the full sense of the word, not trained journalists, but really media staff, click workers, people who are paid by the click, potentially, who are, who are in precarious positions, who are told to produce X number of articles per day, or X number of clicks per day, um, they have, if anything, uh, quite possibly very limited journalistic training. Um, they are certainly not encouraged to adhere to journalistic standards or even have the time to reflect on um, journalistic ethics in, in what they do. They may not even see themselves as journalists, of course. Um, they are also encouraged wherever possible to glean content from other sources. So if it's on one celebrity site, it will soon be on all celebrity sites. Um, because it's just easier to, to write what someone else has already written or simply rip off what someone else has already written uh, than do any kind of original reporting. And that's where I want to, uh, actually in a minute, I'll get back to this as well. But um, 
this is not unfortunately limited only to entertainment and celebrity journalism. And I'm uh, I'm really sorry to say this this is a uh, this is a, 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 a screenshot of an article um, from Australia from the, the News Corp network of websites, which includes the Herald Sun and the Daily Telegraph and other tabloid sites, but also news.com.au as uh, sort of a mainstream middle of the road site and, and other more, if you like, upmarket uh, newspapers or newspaper sites. Um, and this was plastered all over the place um, uh, in those sites. As you see there, it's really a top 10 list of the, well, I can't really say the best misinformation spreaders in Australia, but that's what's implied here ultimately. And it goes down here, as you see there from uh, a, a, a far right politician, Malcolm Roberts, uh, who's a, a, a deep anti-vaxxer to, you know, the other uh, nine people who have, have uh, decided not to show you. Um, now, you can imagine what happens when this article becomes visible. The people who are highlighted here as the top 10 misinformation spreaders are basically saying to their followers, hey, we made the list, we must be doing something right. You know, we must be visible uh, enough um, to, with our alternative information, our, our you know, alternative facts, uh, uh, as, as we might say, as Karen Conley might have said. Um, so this is, it, this is simply encouraging, and it's of course making this much more visible also to ordinary readers who are not normally frequenting the Facebook spaces of, of uh, far-right neo-fascist politicians in Australia, but are instead, um, you know, uh, uh, just visiting more or less mainstream, more or less standard news outlets. Um, so suddenly they are confronted with a list of these alternative sources that perhaps they might want to visit in their spare time. So I think this is deeply, and I'm sorry to say this, and I have the the the, the, the journalist's name on here as well, I, I do have to say very sorry, but this is deeply irresponsible journalism, unfortunately. And it all it does is just amplify further the visibility of these people and encourages them in in their um their their spread of really disinformation ultimately, the ignoring spread of disinformation. And then we've got these sorts of cases. Well, I wanted to get back to this Express article because here you see a BBC article, um, perfectly fine about YouTube saying, well, we're tightening the rules on, on notorious spreaders of uh, mason disinformation like David Icke. Um, and uh, we will start to much more actively take down this sort of stuff. Now, you might, recognize the headline from the Express article um, about uh, Amir Khan that I've shown you previously. Um, you certainly see the similarities, I think, here. Um, the headline is the same. Um, quite a bit of the language is very much the same as well. You see at the bottom, perhaps, there on the BBC, it says the move follows a live streamed interview with conspiracy theorist David Icke on Monday. You know, uh, and, and the Express says at the bottom, YouTube's latest move follows a live streamed interview with notorious conspiracy theorist David Icke yesterday. So this is simply a ripple. This is outright plagiarism. And by the way, I took the screenshot of the article on the right from the Express um, in October last year, um, which is two and a half years after the original um, uh, BBC article was posted. And the Express article was posted uh, literally on the same day. So this is still up. The BBC hasn't even bothered, doesn't even bother anymore, perhaps, with, with trying to um, uh, identify and, and do something about all of these, these cases of, of outright plagiarism. But it isn't just plagiarism, of course. There's something much more malicious going on here, because while the article overall is about YouTube typing its rules on mis and disinformation and conspiracy theories, what you see here is also that the that Tom Fish, uh, if in fact that is the real name of the author on the Express, the plagiarist at the Express, has then chosen to embed a conspiracist video and a poll quote saying there is a link between 5G and this health crisis from David Icke. So that's, to me, no longer simply plagiarism. This is actually very actively malicious, pernicious um, disinformation ultimately, knowing disinformation, knowing embedding of disinformation into an article that's actually about cracking down on disinformation. So that's, I think, deeply, deeply problematic. And um, the fact that it's still up is even more problematic, of course, in the context of all of what we know by now about the pandemic. 
So what can change? What can we do better? Um, we're not going to change celebrities, obviously. They'll continue to do and say what they do and say, and occasionally they'll fall prey to or very happily actively endorse um, conspiracy theories. Um, celebrity news sites and tabloids will continue to cover celebrities. That's true as well, and fans will be fans and will continue to follow them as well. Um, I've got on the right there a more recent example of uh, former Pink Floyd leader Roger Waters saying that he's on a kill list by the Ukrainian government, blah, blah, blah. So this sort of stuff is still going on, of course, and whether it's, if it's no longer COVID, then it's now the Ukraine war, it's all sorts of other things, of course, that, that people have latched onto, celebrities have latched onto as well. Um, what can we do, though? I think there's there's a few simple steps to begin with that can be uh, taken. The first is to, as I've said before, just embed celebrity content if you have to, not take screenshots and, and put them into the articles. And I want to say Prog Magazine has done the right thing, actually, by, by not embedding uh, any kind of posts and, and tweets by Roger Waters, but just sort of reporting what he's saying. That's legitimate, but also uh, debunkable. Um, uh, so embeds not screenshots makes this content much less uh, persistent if the celebrity themselves at some point decides otherwise and takes their posts down again. More, more to the point, even better, not embedding, but simply reporting about the, what these celebrities are saying. Um, uh, so not simply plastering the, the, the tweet or the Facebook post on the page, but reporting about it, ideally, of course, with critical reporting, with fact checking, not just celebrity stenography. Um, so saying, well, is there any truth to this? Is there, how would we know? Is there any kind of likelihood that this might be true? And the article I'm showing you is, is to an extent doing some of this as well um, as, it, as it goes on. Um, but of course, none of this is very likely to happen in the current context, in the current kind of economic environment for particularly entertainment and celebrity journalism. Um, so what really would be required is better journalistic training, better enforcement of journalistic ethics amongst entertainment, celebrity, tabloid reporters. Um, you really need to think much more about the impact that their stenographic reporting of whatever celebrities and others are saying might have on the general public. That is a much bigger task, obviously, and uh, much harder to achieve. But I think that's really what uh, where, where we need to go and what needs to be pushed for uh, by, by any vehicles and any mechanisms that might be available to us. And of course, the other side of this is also the, the fact-checking, the debunking um, that needs to become visible in the same media content uh, context, in the same media platform sites and so on, um, uh, because, uh, ultimately, we, um, uh, you know, it, is, it doesn't help if some some specialist journal is is publishing the fact check, publishing the debunk. If the audiences that have seen the the initial content have not will are not likely to encounter this debunk. So, having said all, all of that, um, I want to finish with some conclusions. Um, first off, as I do so, I want to give due credit. Um, to uh, another researcher, Whitney Phillips, who's done a wonderful uh, piece of work already um, investigating, exploring the ways that journalists themselves think about how they can better cover uh, conspiracy theories, extremists, and other uh, problematic content uh, in their reporting in the oxygen of amplification. Um, but as you see there, this is very much about reporting by mainstream journalists in the context of the 2016 US presidential election, and uh, that only takes us so far. Um, the but here is that the bigger problem that we've observed in the spread of um, COVID 5G conspiracy theories is not actually about um, the way that mainstream professional journalists are covering content, but uh, as you've seen from what I've said, it's the celebrities. The celebrities and celebrity journalism, tabloid journalism, and other forms of uh, related entertainment journalism, this is, as I say, the soft underbelly of journalism. This is how content spreads um, from very obscure sources into mainstream circulation. So how do, how do we deal with this? Well, um, as I finish, I want to give some observations, some recommendations, some key takeaways 
um, on what we found, what we've observed, uh, where we think there are possibilities. First off, we've seen very clearly, and you've seen this in the first few phases of what I've talked about, the immediate impact of conspiracies, of conspiracy uh, theories, of conspiracy sites is very limited. Um, the sites themselves are not very well frequented, and um, really this content circulates just amongst a very small group of hardcore conspiracy theorists. Now, Yes, they are a problem. They're a problem in themselves, but ultimately they are a very distinct group and they have very little influence and impact on the general public. But the problem is that celebrities, if they pick up on this sort of stuff, um, can become super spreaders of this kind of information. Uh, so it's when they amplify this kind of content and when the media that covers celebrities amplify this kind of content, this mis and particularly disinformation gets inserted into mainstream conversations, mainstream coverage, mainstream media, mainstream social media spaces as well. That to me is the, the entry gate for these conspiracy theories into much broader circulation. And this happens as we've seen, particularly through soft news beats, entertainment, sports, celebrity and so on, um, where perhaps there is uh, uh, far less journalistic training, far less adherence to any kind of journalistic ethos, um, partly because, again, these people are not necessarily journalists, they're simply click workers. Um, but these click workers and celebrity journalists, if that's what they are, um, do need to reflect much more on the impact that they have and act more responsibly. And if they will not do this uh, out of their own initiative, then we need to find ways to make them, to make to 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 um, push a much greater accountability in this soft underbelly of journalism. That to me is one of the big challenges. It's and it, as I've said, it's not easy because there are very few mechanisms to push in that direction at this point. We've also seen, and I've, I've mentioned this along the way a little bit, that uh, takedowns can actually be effective, not so much in entirely killing off conspiracy uh, theories, that would be too much to ask, but in delaying dissemination, in, in hindering the further dissemination of this problematic content, particularly amongst ordinary users. Um, when stories are being flagged as, as false, uh, when they're being highlighted as problematic, when perhaps users are being nudged not to share them, but particularly also when the content overall is being taken down, of course, that ultimately um, reduces the circulation because it's a lot harder for people to unshare this kind of content. And uh, A, they'll think twice. B, they might not go to the effort of, of continuing to share it um, unless they're really, really committed to this conspiracy theory already. So ordinary users are far less likely to share content that's been taken down, that's been flagged in some form. And what it does ultimately, the way we describe it is that it increases the communicative distance between the fringe and the mainstream. Um, so it's, it makes it much harder for this kind of content to skip from the fringe to the mainstream, to skip from the conspiracy circles into wide, wider mainstream circulation. Um, now, the problem again, as we've seen, is that the news coverage, particularly from entertainment tabloid, celebrity journalism, undermines these kinds of takedowns, particularly when it creates more persistent copies by um, sharing screenshots, by embedding screenshots of this kind of content, um, sometimes even embedding full videos from alternative uh, uh, video sharing sites uh, rather than from YouTube. Um, that again increases the circulation, even if this, if this content has been taken down from mainstream um, social media and video sharing platforms. Um, so this is a practice, again, that is deeply problematic, of course. And then, finally, there is also the question of when mainstream organizations, whether it's the government or uh, relevant other organizations, and in the case of the COVID 5G conspiracy theory, for instance, technology uh, groups and others, when they should respond. Um, clearly, this should have happened earlier on in the particular case that we've been looking at uh, before, of course, the attacks started to happen on the mobile phone towers. But of course, it should also not happen so early that in itself it aids dissemination by making this uh, content much more visible. So um, that uh, picking the right time is in itself quite difficult. And of course, um, there is a need also to respond in a way that 
actually reaches the same audiences, that reaches particularly the celebrity and celebrity and tabloid media audiences, um, simply responding in a way that gets picked up by the New York Times and the Washington Post doesn't help much if people don't read those types of outlets, uh, but if they do read uh, tabloid and uh, entertainment media outlets. Um, so the difficulty here is getting the debunks, the fact checks, um, the uh, the corrections into the same spaces where the original conspiracy theories uh, ended up circulating in, in, in the mainstream. So to give you an example of this, well, here's the UN responding to the COVID 5G conspiracy, saying it's a hoax with no technical basis, quite rightly. But this happens, uh, as you might see there, on the 22nd of April 2020. That's uh, a good half month after the phone towers burned in the UK. Uh, here's the, the UK government responding to the 5G COVID um, uh, conspiracy theory, saying there is no evidence of a link between 5G, and it goes on from there. That's published a good month after uh, the arson attacks. Um, here's the Australian government, again, talking about misinformation linking 5G and, and COVID. Um, that's uh, you know a month and a half after the arson attacks in the UK. Um, and the problem is that the arson attacks themselves, as you see here, happened in early April. So um, all of this comes very much after the fact. Now, it's still relevant, perhaps, to respond to these conspiracy theories after the fact as well. It's, it's certainly not, um, uh, not a problem to do so. But ideally, you'd want to respond well ahead of time in order for these attacks not to happen in the first place. So responding, for instance, when the celebrity journalism amplification of these kinds of claims kicks in would have been a lot more effective, presumably, um, than responding well after the fact. Now, that's easy to say in hindsight, of course, but of course, it would have been possible to do what we've done also after the fact um, in our research. It would have been possible to track these kinds of conspiracy theories at the time they were being shared and to respond much more quickly once the first few celebrities got involved and make sure that counter information is also circulating. Um, that, from all we've seen, didn't particularly happen. It certainly didn't, ha didn't happen in the right venues, in spaces where um, you know, the, the original tabloid and celebrity audiences might have seen this kind of content. So uh, it would have been would have been possible and important to respond much more quickly, much more proactively, and much more focused on those celebrity entertainment tabloid spaces where these conspiracy theories circulate. So that to me is um, something that really needs to happen much more, that needs to be addressed much more. Finally, I want to conclude here with uh, an attempt at an analogy. And uh, of course, we, we hear so much about these uh, analogies relating to viral information, viral circulation. I don't want to overstretch this, but there are, of course, some uh, similarities here between the actual virus of, of uh, COVID-19 and the viral circulation of mis- and disinformation. Um, in some ways, what we've seen, in fact, is that the takedowns, the deplatforming, and digital literacy in initiatives as well, actually, um, that have happened and that continue to happen in the context of COVID-19 and other conspiracy theories are the digital equivalent in many ways of the lockdowns, the quarantines, the mask mandates. They are not able to deal with the, the virus itself. They're not, they're not helping protect uh, people from infection as such, but they're slowing the spread of this problematic information, much as lockdowns and quarantines and masks and so on, slow the spread of the, the, viral, the, the, the viral load itself uh, across communities. Um, so this is a, a first stopgap measure to deal with the symptoms, but not the cause of the, uh, the problem. Um, the more profound way of dealing with both of these issues is on the digital side, on the informational side, uh, a much longer term effort at de-radicalization. And that's maybe equivalent in some ways to the much longer term also vaccination effort that, of course, is happening around the world now, um, because that ultimately starves the, the virus of potential carriers, of potential super spreaders. Um, but, of course, Vaccination only works if the majority of the population are vaccinated. 
um, de-radicalization also only works if the majority of the population are not falling prey to radical ideas, to conspiracist ideas. Um, so this is a, a whole of population effort and a long term, a difficult effort, because it's much harder to do this at scale. And it's much harder, of course, to, to keep this up in the long term. Spot. So that, I think, is is the, the, the way of dealing with the problem itself rather than just the symptoms of the problem. And in both cases, of course, this needs to be uh, accompanied by uh, public information campaigns. That's really, I guess, what I've what I've just said about uh, responding by debunking, by fact checking, and so on. What we need urgently with both COVID nineteen itself and with the conspiracy theories around it is clear, accurate information from trustworthy public officials and other stakeholders. Um, that's been important during the height of COVID-19. It's still incredibly important now, both for the viral in information itself and for the infodemic related to the pandemic. Um, the community needs to be able to trust um, both in the physical and in the inf informational health measures that are being undertaken. Um, and there's a lot of work still to do there as well. So with that, I'll leave it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope this has been useful uh, for you as well. Thank you very much and goodbye.